in the meantime, we'll pass it on to Dr. Adam Coates. He is the Assistant Professor of Forest and Fire Ecology and Management at Virginia Tech. And he's going to talk about the fuel and photo guide that a couple of folks have mentioned already today. So Adam, you can go ahead and share your screen and go ahead. Well, good. thank you. I'm Adam Coates. I'm an Assistant Professor of Forest Fire Ecology and Management at Virginia Tech and have been in that role since 2017. Um, Appreciate the opportunity to be with you all today. I'm sorry that we can't be face to face, but we'll do it. We'll do it virtual and do the best that we can. So, um, yeah, a couple of speakers have already mentioned the fuels photo guide that we had come out at the end of 2019. Um, so, just want to share with you a little bit of the information about it and talk about how it was developed um, and how you might be able to use it <clears throat> to assess fuel loads um, with sites that you're planning on burning or also thinking about ones that might um, have considerable uh, wildfire hazard. So collaborators on this project were Dr. Tom Waldrop, Helen Moore, and then uh, Todd Hutchinson with this Forest Service uh, Northern Research Station. So just the, the highlights, talk a little bit about the background of just fuel photo series overall, uh, maybe even give a reference to, to a few others that might be applicable for particular sites that you're thinking about burning or that you're managing. Um, talk a little bit about the new guide and kind of how it was um, put together to talk about the opportunities that are presented by it. Um, and then also some of the limitations that are there as we put it together. I think uh, knowing that anything that you do is going to have a certain set of limitations to it. Um, and then think about going forward uh, some things that we're doing at Virginia Tech to look at continue to develop um, a fuel photo guide model and maybe even look at, at like a fuels app that we'd be able to use online um, in real time to assess fuel conditions at a given location. So I think we all, as, as part of the prescribed fire council, I think we all have a, an affinity for prescribed fire. Um, it's pretty interesting to talk to folks in other regions and in other locations about how they're using prescribed fire and what type of fire behavior they're seeing. So just looking at this, you can see the nightmare of dealing with rhododendron and other ericaceous fuels that might present unique use situations, unique burning issues um, with some of our plots and some of our locations, particularly when we're gearing towards restoration of given um, species, particularly fire adapted species like some of the oak and hickory forests, we might be really targeting for prescribed fire restoration. And so as part of the, the fire triangle, you know we can make fire and if we have oxygen, heat, and then fuel, but those types of fuel differ and they create different fire behavior under different burning conditions, especially when we, we assess a fire environment and the fire behavior that we want to target. So when we think about, you know, applying fire, I think one of the unique things about a photo guide and actually just thinking in general is that we know over space and time, you know, over a given change over space and time, we might see that if you were to create a flame and actually expand that to a fire event and then begin to do multiple fires over a given period of time in a given region in a given vegetative complex, you can begin to alter kind of what is going to be representative of that fire regime and the type of fire behavior you're going to generate as a result of using prescribed fire at different frequencies and at different intensities. So I think that's it's pretty unique with a photo guide to think about um, one thing that we didn't specifically target with this guide, but I think that we could target with other guides and other resources is what happens when you use burns multiple times in a given location. How do those fuels change? How does fire behavior subsequently change? And how can we apply you know, that on the landscape when we think about alterations in fire regime overall, which I think a lot of us are targeting with multiple burns in a given location. So when you look at kind of the history of photo guides, um, they were developed as a tool. You know, a lot of the methods and techniques that we use to quantify fuels and to give estimates of fuels, they're pretty labor intensive. A lot of them use um, depth as an example, like litter depth and, and duff depth. They'll use those depths to then uh, estimate or approximate a mass of that material, and then that can be used then to calculate tons per acre and smoke, uh, approximate smoke uh, dispersal and those types of things. So it's about 50 years of photo guide um, knowledge that we have in place for different regions and different fuel complexes. Um, one that was created in the late 1990s um, is a photos for estimating fuel loadings before and after prescribed burning in the upper coastal plain of the southeast. Um, this was done by Eric Scholl and Tom Waldrop. Um, and a funny story for this one, um, when I was working on my PhD, I was working in the coastal plain of South Carolina. I'm looking at longleaf restoration and really managing longleaf in one particular location for a red cockaded woodpecker habitat. One of the things we wanted to do is to see that if you do multiple burns, do you actually alter soil conditions and do you change the chemical content of the litter and duff? And so I wanted to know specifically exactly across different plots within different stands, 
exactly how much litter and duff was there. Um, and I can remember getting in touch with Dr. Waldrop and asking him, hey, is there a photo guide that we might be able to use for this or a good way to go about approaching this, um, you know, kind of fuel estimation? Um, and he referenced this guide. And I was like, well, that's really cool and all, but like maybe this isn't exactly suited to the exact site that I'm going to be looking at. And so I went on this, you know, a um, little bit of a tangent of doing Brown's transects, which I'll show you in a minute how those are done. That can be pretty labor intensive. And in a lot of cases, one individual kind of has to be responsible for doing a lot of the measurements. Um, and as a PhD student that didn't have a lot of money to have assistance uh, to help me do these tallies, I was going to be doing all this work by myself. So I took it upon myself to do destructive samples of litter and duff, actually pulling all of that material out of the woods and, and measuring it in a lab. Um, then grinding it up and doing chemical analysis on it, um, and then also doing the Brown's transects. And so as I did that and got done with it, um, after about six months worth of work, um, spending every day in the field, basically, I went back and referenced this guy based on the numbers that I had gotten in the field. Um, and I don't know if you can see the text is probably pretty small, um, but in some of the, the tallies of slash for the coarse woody debris, and then in some of the tallies for the litter and the final total tally of fuel on the ground on my sites, um, that fuel guide was roughly uh, one one hundredth uh, of a of a tons per acre off from what I actually measured in the field across my 150 plots. And so the short story of that was I probably should have just assumed the fuel guide was pretty good and used it, um, but I did not. Um, and so I learned my lesson on that one. That so. And that way, these fuel guys, I think, really can expedite and can provide a lot of assistance when you might not have a crew on hand prior to prescribed burning, when you're trying to estimate fuel loads and get, and get pretty good numbers about the exact components that you have available. These fuel guys do a pretty good job in a lot of situations to give you these, these really um, you know, high confidence estimates of what you're going to see on the ground. So shifting a little, this one was created by Dale Wade and others to look at um, post-hurricane residues and fire behavior in southern pines. And the unique thing about this guide, and you'll see that with, with all the guides, there are, some, there are some unique benefits to each one. In this particular guide, you can see that he actually shows pictures of what a site looked like before, what it looked like during a fire, and then what it looked like after. Um, and then all of the stand conditions are stated here, the burning conditions when burning of the slash was conducted what the relative fire behavior was when they were looking at crown damage left over within the stand. And so that's a pretty unique guide geared specifically for stands that may have been damaged um, as a result of hurricanes. Bros with the Northern Research Station with the Forest Service uh, created this guide called the Photo Guide for Estimating Fuel Loading and Fire Behavior in Mixed Oak Forests of the Mid-Atlantic Region. Um, and so this one is pretty unique for the sites that it kind of selected that there are different complexes that are listed. So you have one here that's listed as leaf litter. Again, a unique thing with this one is that there are pictures both before the stand was um, you know, subjected to prescribed fire and then as it was burned. And so you can kind of see this kind of rough estimate of what fire behavior was given the weather and fire behavior that were present during the time of the burn. It has a leaf litter complex. That's listed. There are several other complexes that are listed, including an irrigation shrub component, which would apply to many of us in a lot of locations. Um, the interesting thing here is it is geared more towards the mid-Atlantic. That's where these, these plots were measured. And so you're dealing with some in New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and other locations uh, further north. So again, with these models, you know, the kind of the goal in the end is to think about, well, once you have this idea of fuel mass, you have this idea of kind of the fuel bed, the fuel structure and arrangement that you might have in a given location. Hopefully you could use these tools to kind of think about wildfire hazard and wildfire behavior, prescribed fire behavior, potential fire effects, and then think about smoke emissions when you take these loads and actually enter them into a software package. So when we get into the Appalachians, I think one of the, the driving forces behind creating an Appalachian specific fuel guide was that you have all these different forest types that are represented, you know, all these eco zones that we could list where we would think about given their relative time since last burn or last disturbance even, you know, you're going to have unique fuel complexes that are represented in each one of these. And so how do we determine then, we know that all of these um, may not necessitate and, and require fire for restoration um, quite like another one would. All of them are going to have different components that we seek to restore. All of them are going to have different, you know, fuel complexes that are represented in each one with different flammability and emission and things like that. So. We really want to do a, a pretty good job of, of thinking about when we're thinking about Southern Appalachians, especially 
what do these different fuel complexes look like as they're spread out across these eco zones? And you'll see that represented in the guide that we, we put together last year. So the Southern Appalachian Guide, I actually listed the link to it in the chat if you wanted to pull it up and open it up. Um, Helen also offered to mail hard copies of it. We're really excited that we have it out. It's, it's geared to be about a five by seven inch guide that could go in a vest pocket. It's got a spiral bound so you can open. Um, actually, the, the picture that you'll see on the left is kind of can be, the guide can be opened to where you see that picture on top. And then the table will be listed on the bottom. So literally the idea is to go into the field and you can pick um, an aspect and an elevation that you might be situated on, thumb through the guide to see if a picture matches what you're seeing on the ground. And then that should give you a relative estimate of what the fuel loading is based on what you see, the picture that you select as you're standing in the woods. And we'll talk about that a little bit more as I flip through some other photos. So there are 74 photos that are included in the guide. There's a the large range of, of, of mixes and, and eco zones that are represented to select from. To think about how it was created, again, a moment ago, I talked a little bit about um, Brown's transects. Um, Brown's transects were implemented at about 705 plots in North Carolina, Georgia, Tennessee, and South Carolina. And from that large pool of plots, we then pared down to about 74 photographs that we really wanted, we thought represented a broad, a broad stroke of the variety of the fuel complexes represented in those 705 plots. Um, we did choose dormant season only pictures, um, really because a lot of the prescribed fires that we're planning are happening in that late dormant season period. And um, so that is one, you know, subset that was put towards this guide, one confining factor that we used when we were creating the guide. Um, data was available for eco zones, um, landscape variables like elevation um, and aspect. Um, shrub cover we did take into account. So you'll see on the left there in that image, we use a 0.025 acre air cases shrub and ground cover plot to estimate the amount of shrub cover at each given location. And then we used Brown's transects and the, the layout for those is actually shown in the image on the left as well. You can see that three transects are laid out. They're approximately separate, separated at a 45 degree angle. Um, they're 50 foot in length. And so along each one of those transects, different components um, of the woody fuels are measured. So this is some that are laid out on pretty flat ground in the coastal plain. This was some plots that I worked on as part of my PhD project at Clemson. But if you're not familiar with that, along each one of the transects, you'll see on the left, um, one hour, 10 hour, 100 and 1000 hour fuels are taken into account at different lengths along that 50 foot transect. Um, not to dig too much into the nitty gritty of that, but that's basically on each one of those three transects that's laid out, they're taken into a, a tally is done of each one of those fuel categories. And then later that is then taken from a tally count and separated into you're scaling up to tons per acre based on the tallies that you have. Um, along the transects at 12, 25, and 40 feet, we're taking uh, assessments also of litter, duff, and fuel bed depth. Um, so then thinking about what is the depth of the litter, what is the depth of the duff, and then what is the, basically you could think of it as the depth or the height of any woody fuels that sit above that transect um, from the top of the litter layer all the way to the base of the woody fuel. And so that we have that listed as fuel bed height. Thinking about, again, the top, the kind of the depth of the woody fuels that are there. So again, how to use the guide, there are 12 aspect and elevation combinations that were created. You can see that we, we really separated um, aspect into kind of four directions, thinking about northerly aspects, easterly, southerly, and then westerly aspects. Um, with elevation, we had 1,000 to 1,999 feet, 2,000 to 3,499, and then anything above 3,500 feet. So again, kind of the reference for using the guide is to know where you're situated on the landscape. You know, if you're at a more northerly aspect at 3,500 feet, there is a section in the guide where you can select that specific location. Um, within that location, there will be a set of photographs that you can choose from. Um, some that may be more geared toward heavier loads of coarse woody debris. Some that may be geared more towards uh, a heavier air cases shrub component. And so just sorting through the guide that way, hopefully as you're in the field, you can then kind of select um, and give a, the, the guide will then provide a reference of approximate fuel loading that you would see. Um, I, I have it listed there kind of as a note, you know, one 10, 100 hour fuel load differences um, could be what points out the difference in what you're seeing on the ground as you're just seeing 
For example, if you're seeing more 100-hour fuels, you're in an area that's been you know, more heavily impacted by wind damage or something like that, you may say, well, there is a heavier woody fuel load here. Maybe this photo fits that better. Um, you may also um, actually be able to see um, that basal area appears to differ. We don't have basal area actually listed in um, the photo guide. Um, due to the nature of the way the plots were taken, you, all the basal area is relatively similar in a lot of the plots. And so we didn't specifically list basal area as a defining factor for each one of those. But you'll be able to see that as an approximation just by the way the photo is laid out. So here's some other examples for you. Um, here's one that is, is listed as the ecozone as a dry mesic oak forest. Um, you actually have aspect here of 125 degrees and elevation at 2,581 feet. Um, relative slope percentage is another landscape variable that we included. And then as you look at the photo, you know, you're actually being able to, to determine based on the photo kind of what you're seeing in terms of the, the, the way the fuels are laid out um, in terms of woody debris and the litter component that you might be able to see. And so again, we have that listed out as the total woody fuels that are there between 1, one plus 10 plus 100, then add the 1,000 hour fuels and that should come up to on this one 18.2 tons per acre. Um, not a lot of ericaceous shrubs in this particular plot, and then also vegetation less than one foot tall we had listed here as potential source of thinking about in particularly these late dormant season burns, how much they might add to, to fire behavior. And so that can be a distinguishing feature, you know, with some of the aspect and elevation combinations that you might see. This was in an acidic cove, again, kind of at a northerly um, that's why this one would be more of kind of an easterly aspect, thinking about the elevation of 1,000 to 1,999 feet. And so woody fuel loads here, actually a good bit lower than in the last plot that we looked at. Um, no significant air case of shrub component here. Vegetation less than one foot tall that would contribute to fire behavior was listed as zero for this particular plot as well. So you can see the color here changed. It goes to a green for the aspect and elevation combination of 226 degrees to 315 and then elevation greater than 3,500 feet. An air case is shrub plot for sure. And so it can be listed as over 100% here based on the idea that these shrubs were actually hanging out over the air cases shrub, the measurement of those, um, the plot. Again, it was taken in a 0.025 acre plot. The crown dimensions for each one of these shrubs was measured, and so you could get a percentage over 100 if those crown dimensions exceeded the size of the plot that we sampled in. So this is one of the ones that um, if you're a master's or a PhD student and you're having to work in these day in and day out, you may not uh, really enjoy too much and question your existence in some of these plots. But they are measured and they are there. And so it is a, a complex that a lot of us have to deal with thinking about prescribed fire, either for kind of natural breaks where we'll have uh, fire behavior kind of stymied and, and kind of tamped down, or in places if they're really, really dry, we could have um, kind of ladder fuels that are there to promote uh, fire behavior that we may not desire overall. And so those are included in the guide and a lot of the, the photos um, and the plots that were represented. Just into a different kind of mix here, um, total woody fuels are at 7.2 tons per, tons per acre. No significant air cases shrub cover, but about 7% of these plots were covered in a vegetation less than one foot tall. And here, a higher elevation, thinking about a, a more northerly plot here, 31% um, slope. You see that the aspect is 37 degrees of where the transect would actually ran for this plot. Um, and then a higher woody, total woody fuel load um, that is largely uh, affected by a higher proportion of 1,000-hour fuels. And so when we're thinking about fire behavior and thinking about prescribed fire behavior in here, this may be a consideration that you have for some of the significant kind of effects of um, if the thousand hour fuels are actually going to be, they're, they're present on the site, but are they available to burn given the weather conditions and maybe days since precipitation that you're dealing with if you've gone through a recent drought or any of that stuff. So that's listed in there as well. So potential opportunities for improvement, you can see just kind of going back one image, you can see what we have listed there. Those are based on the variables that we had um, measured as, as the work was being done. Um, and then actually thinking about you know, um, what could we what could we confidently have assessment in, such as basal area and other variables that, that we might want to measure and, and know for a given plot. So thinking about moving forward, um, looking at disturbance history. So in places where we had high hemlock mortality, maybe southern pine beetle impacts, thinking about other disturbances that could be there that would largely contribute to um, an increase in particular components of the woody fuel base, especially. 
Um, that's something that we weren't specifically targeting with the guide. Um, that is one thing that I've currently been working on with some plots um, at Great Smoky Mountains National Park, thinking about hemlock mortality, especially to see if changes in fuels have taken place as hemlock has has kind of suffered from the adelgid um, in, in the last 20 years. So we're comparing plots that were measured in the early 2000s to ones that were measured last year. Um, thinking about Mount Laurel and rhododendron expansion um, could be something that would be targeted um, with maybe an, addi an addition to this guide or maybe a separate guide altogether. Um, scaling things to litter and duff masses, we, we weren't 100% confident in taking the depths that we had and scaling those to tons per acre to give managers an actual value of tons per acre. Some of that is really um, pretty geared towards, you know, the season that you're measuring litter and duff in um, and that the bulk density of the litter and duff base. And so scaling that up to uh, an overall mass um, seemed to be somewhat problematic, particularly for this guide and the, and the way that we had our data laid out. I'm um, thinking about burning in different seasons. Um, the burn images, again, that we used um, were particularly places that hadn't been burned for a while, you know, for, for, for 10 to 15 years. And so thinking about locations that have been burned multiple times um, could be something else where we expand some of the opportunities for other fuel guides and other um, tools. You know, and that's just a, an example of season from the coastal plain of how, you know, you've got the same plot that's measured in different seasons. And then once it's finally burned, you know, we burned in the growing season, being able to see, I mean, some different things happened there when we, when we were burning in a different uh, season, you had a different amount of fuels that were there available to burn. Another approach that has been kind of applied out west that, that we've been playing with at Virginia Tech is, is this idea of a photo load guide. Um, what, what generally is done with this is everything is set up in one meter square. And the idea here is that any given technician or a researcher could go out, set out a one meter square um, in the field and then go back and reference these photos. So thinking about, you know, if you're mainly dealing with a pine, you know, litter base, think about in that meter square, how much pine litter, litter are you actually seeing on the ground? Um, the tricky part with this, as we've played with it, is, you know, there are some different species they have listed here. Um, they are species specific with the types, with the, you know, diameters of uh, woody fuels that they're adding in these one meter squares. And then the depth that they're adding the, that material is really variable too. But the idea here is they put everything on a white background, and then as you go out in the field and see these fuels mixed together, the, the goal is to then select between the pictures. So if you think, you know, that your picture looks more like 2.25 tons per acre for one hour fuels, as opposed to 3.15 tons per acre, making a judgment call of which one it looks more like, and then adding that as one of the fuel components as you tally in the field. Um, we've played with that a little bit, like I said, in Virginia. Um, and here's an image here where they're doing that with 100 hour fuels and then also with 1000 hour fuels. Um, I haven't had a graduate student that was super, super motivated to work on that project yet. I've been doing a lot of the work on that myself. Um, and I think there's some potential there for that. We do just have a lot more species to kind of consider um, in terms of that loading component. And so I think we're, we're at a place of kind of thinking through that, how it would be a useful, maybe a, another useful technique to have in our toolbox. Um, but then again, separating that into different components, whether that be elevation aspect, different fuel types would be something that we we're still working on. Um, we've been doing a lot of destructive samples and taking the one meter photographs um, in the school forest here in, in Virginia, um, right adjacent to Virginia Tech. We've also been looking at how this guide specifically it's geared toward plots in the southern Appalachians, but how it might apply at plots in the central Appalachians um, and, di and slightly different species mixes with slightly different components of aspect and elevation. And we're, we've been looking at that a little bit. Um, so far, so good. It seems like the loads are pretty well um, dictated um, and, and are, are pretty indicative of the, the site types that we're visiting. So I think that's been pretty promising. So in future ideas, just again, getting back to those litter and duff masses. Um, we've been doing a lot of work with um, remote sensing and using ground-based LIDAR to look at the depths of fuel beds, look at different components and to scale those up using imagery. Um, the idea is that the image can then be used to isolate specific components within an image and then scale up to tons per acre estimate. Um, it takes a lot of work at a computer to do that. Um, we've had a little bit more success doing on the coastal plain than in the Appalachians, but we've continued to work on that. Um, the idea, again, I mentioned earlier of maybe transferring 
one of these ideas of a photo guide to an app that where you're standing and in what fuel complex you might be standing in, maybe that app could give a reference for the actual real time location that you're standing in. That's probably a ways off, but something we can certainly shoot for. So with that, I know some some questions were, were popping up um, and I can't actively see the chat when I have this screen up, um, but feel free. I, I think there's a minute or so to, to think about a question or two. So, but again, thank you for the opportunity to be here and, and share this with you. Thanks, Adam. Um, yeah, so there's some been some good discussion in the chat and I'll try and just summarize it. Um, there were questions about the available metrics that indicate what fuel is actually available to burn and uh -huh. how that relates to the information that your photo guide gives. Um, mm -hmm. So if you have any comments on that or on plans to look more at those metrics or expand the photo guide relative to that. Yeah, so availability, I think, is probably one of those things that is more targeted toward the manager in place and kind of looking at the fuel complex that you have um, we don't have any specific weather variables or any of that that were listed for the times when these fuels were measured. Um, and so in terms of that idea of availability and what's going to be there available to burn, I think that kind of then is dictated by, you know, the plan that you have in place for your prescribed burn plan, what you're targeting for fire behavior. Um, and hopefully that can then be referenced. You know, these, these just serve as the loading estimates to then enter into some of the other tools that you might use to predict expected fire behavior and then subsequently think about you know potential fire effects and then maybe adam when you hop off and you are able to see the chat if you want to take a look if you have any additional comments to sure. get into some of the discussion that's been happening there Absolutely. Um, in the meantime thank you so much for that presentation that was really informative